Would you please check your ideas and opinions at the door? All your philosophical and religious views, all your logic, because I say check it at the door advisedly because you can pick it up again when you go out if you feel unsafe without it. I'm not trying to argue you out of your opinions and views. I'm merely suggesting that for the sake of an experiment, you temporarily suspend them. Hello and welcome to the Philosophical Minds Podcast, an exploration of all things philosophical, alchemical, and esoteric, from the psycho-spiritual to the material-chemical nature of the all. Join me and my guests as we inquire into the liminality of mind and matter, and tend to the fertile soils of awareness and perception, while facilitating an expanded consciousness from the individual to the collective. If you enjoy the show and find it of value, consider supporting and becoming a patron via the Patreon at patreon.com slash philosophicalminds. A small contribution makes a big difference and definitely makes it easier for me to continue the show. Although, I will always do my best to keep it flowing regardless. Thank you all, and let's get into it. All right, today I'm here with Dr. Joseph Lumpkin, a theologian, church historian, and author of over 25 books. He has a doctorate in ministry and has acted as chaplain to several family outreach programs. He is CEO of Fifth Estate Publishing. He's got a passion for martial arts and is a teacher of Shinsei Hapkido. Did I pronounce that correctly? Yeah, you did. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Currently holds a black belt. Most people get that one wrong. <laughs> Yeah, it's a little tough. Um, and then also a computer systems engineer, and you were a contractor for the DOD, the Department of Defense, on some projects involving hypersonic missile technology and supercomputer clustering. So very, very diverse background there. So there's there's obviously a, a lot that we could talk about. But um, firstly, I just thank you for taking the time and doing this. No problem. I, I enjoy it. Uh, I'd actually gotten out of it, kind of semi-retired, but uh, one uh, asked me to come back in, and so here we are. And so glad you picked me up. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad I'm able to have you. So it seems like uh, you produce some of like the best modern day translations of ancient religious texts out there, and so when it comes to the various translations of some of these texts. What what are some of the methods or the practices that that you kind of feel separate the wheat from the chaff, so to speak, in terms of like when it comes to assembling like a really good quality uh, translation? Well, um, a quality translation depends on a quality text to begin with. And that's rather difficult to come by sometimes. Can you read it? Does it have holes in it? Uh, is it a palimpsest? And we'll go over that in a minute. Uh, does it have missing pieces, that kind of thing. Uh, and then how authentic is it? Uh, one of the problems that we have with, uh, with uh, Scripture in, in general is that you can have, uh, let's say you have A and B, and A is written at 0 B.C. or you know, 1 B.C., let's say there's no 0, 1 B.C., and then B would be written at like uh, 50, and, uh, and they... They have different lineages, you might say. Their, their parentage is different. They came out of a, a different uh, original text. Okay, so the original and it splits off. And you would think that the the more you got back in history, the the, the, the older it gets, the more accurate it can be. And sometimes that's not true. Sometimes your uh, the the um, say the second or third or fourth generation scribe makes a mistake. And that mistake is propagated down. And it does not have to be uh, that the oldest one is the most accurate. It's the one where the scribe made less errors to begin with, or those errors accumulated at a lower rate as the, as the propagation went on. Remembering that um, uh, the, uh, the Gutenberg Press wasn't invented until like, the 1400s, so 
up until that point, you had to do hand copying. And so you, you had the scriptorians. You, you had a, a scribe who might be reading to three or four or five other scribes, and they're, they're copying this text. And this is uh, <clears throat> uh, what could be hard of hearing. Uh, one could be, you know, his spelling could be off. Because remember, there was no dictionary. And so uh, you, you had different spellings, and sometimes it gets pretty trashy. Even in the Middle English, before the dictionaries appeared to uh, standardize our languages, uh, the word he, for example, in, in, in the white uh, so it could be H-E, H-E-E, H-E-I. Uh, you, you had all kinds of spellings, and so that was another uh, which people don't really think about. Uh, and so that's, that's to begin with. And, and then how do you render the translation? say, shut the door, or close the door, or slam the door, or... And so, you, you have different feelings within the translation. And here's here's the last thing I'll say before we uh, go on to something else. You have to decide how you want to translate it. Do you want an interlinear, a word-for-word -word translation? Well, those things will they'll melt your mind. If you open up an interlinear of uh, Greek... Uh, and, and you look at it, uh, well, just imagine Spanish, you have uh, you know, door white instead of the white door, right? You, you flip words around. And so your, your descriptives, your adjectives and adverbs might be on a different side of the, of the, of the noun. And uh, it can get very, very confusing. So in a linear, you, you have a word for word, you usually have the word there that you know is translated. You can really get down into the nitty gritty of what the language actually was supposed to mean. Most people don't want that because uh, it's very difficult to read. Uh, then you have a, let's call it a sentence by sentence, which is more like what the, uh, the Bibles are today. And then they'll take a, uh, a sentence and they'll frame it in the uh, context of of uh, and, and the grand, grammatical flow of what's going on today in modern English. And, that. and then you have, uh, <clears throat> we'll call it a, a thought by thought, um, an idea by idea. And that's more like the message Bible, which is really easy to read, but you know you're leaving some nuances behind. Uh, so those are the three very basic types of translation. And you have mixtures like the Amplified Bible, which is kind of a line by line, but when they get to a, a word that they think means expanding, uh, they, they amplify or expand that particular word, and it gives you a little bit more meat. So those are the uh, those are the translation uh, approaches that you can take. And then, so say uh, there is some kind of discrepancy with some errors across multiple text. Is the idea or part of the approach? Would you kind of cross-reference all of the various texts that you have available to you and then use the context as well to try to inform your overall perspective? I, I, I would imagine that would be difficult because scribes might be copying things incorrectly as well. That's right. It's propagated incorrectly. So if you have discrepancies, here's a, a very odd rule that we always take. You take the hardest one. The hardest one is usually the one that's going to be more likely to be accurate. And the reason for that is that a scribe will go on and then he'll, he'll say, well, this doesn't flow right, or maybe they meant this, and, and they'll change the, uh, the wording, they'll change, they'll change it around. So if you read something, you go, that's kind of difficult. That's probably going to be the correct one. You know, there, there's a great line in Monty Python where uh, the life of flying, where they're kind of standing at a distance and they're listening to Jesus and he goes, what did he say? Blessed are the cheesemakers. I think he means the entire dairy industry. Right? And and that, I, I broke out laughing. I looked at my wife and I said, that's exactly what's going on in religion right now. Exactly. I don't quite understand what's going on. Maybe it's this translation. But then maybe he means this. And the scribes would plug it in. That's and it made it flow with the rest of it. The Bible is not a book. It's a library. But when you get it together in one volume, the scribes had a tendency to try to make A match with B. 
even when these guys didn't know each other, they had never seen each other, they didn't know it's going to flow together in one volume. They wanted A to match B because they wanted their theology to be meshed together nicely, even though the original might not have meant that. That's that's a really funny example, actually. It kind of puts it into perspective a little bit. <laughs> I've really been fascinated just with ancient history and religions and ancient texts as, as far as I can remember. And it's always been really interesting to me in regards to Christianity in particular, you know, listening to just friends or family and their perspectives and kind of discussing specific views on what makes one a quote unquote true Christian and the sort of righteous mind states that sometimes can kind of manifest um, and, you know, what's correct versus incorrect and how people arrive at their uh, various different conclusions. And there's just an insane amount of versions of Christianity and there's a lot. And it seemed to me like some individuals, you know, they just wanted to figure out what, what it was that they have to accept in order to escape maybe the possibility of eternal damnation. And then they maybe want to latch on to whatever the most compelling or hypnotic orator or a person that they might gravitate towards in the church perhaps, and, you know, kind of bounce around at different churches, but at least that's just my observation from growing up in that kind of culture. Um, and for me, it's just interesting you know, within what, like, like the confines of the canons or the text that they often grew up with and they learned to accept that that to them is what they deem their one and true valid source. And so many things myself, I just ended up kind of getting to the point where I've been to various different churches and I've heard various preachers and often kind of regurgitating the same talking points and in a, in a sort of cycle and just so many things didn't make sense to me. Um, I know I have Mormon friends, Catholic friends, non-denominational Jewish, and you know, most of them just appeared to be kind of going along with the structures and the cultures of belief that they were born into for various reasons, whether, whether it be that maybe the family might like disown them or think less of them if they deviated, or perhaps maybe they felt guilty about, something that they had done and it, they had that goal of redemption. But I just got where I became really just interested in the truth and, you know, at least what's the most probable or or what's important to take away from all of this information. And I had to just step back and say to myself that I can't really accept anything that I'm hearing from any one individual because just a singular source, it kind of confines everybody to their own limitations and their biases. So I just, I want to know about all the texts and all the ancient religions and the origins and how, how we got the texts, you know, the languages, the cultures surrounding them, when and where they were translated and, and all of that. And the, maybe the political or societal motivations that may have influenced the interpretations or you know, what's deemed authentic, all of it. And so I continue to kind of entertain and explore various perspectives to this day. Um, and it's kind of led me to a greater understanding of things like the Bible, although that understanding, it's still super infantile compared to guys like you. And I have to, you know, always expand my interest learning about these things. Like, there's like the Nag Hammadi scriptures, there's the Apocrypha, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Book of Enoch. But yeah, uh, like Christianity and the Bible, um, it's particularly fascinating because it's kind of close to me because when people say the Bible, they often have a an assumption that that means a very specific set of books, that they're the only authentic and genuine texts that are worthy of inquiry and that they assume is their canon. And it's you know, it's universal. So I want to start there because it's it's simply not the case that there are there is only one canon. And so if you may, I would love to get your perspective on canonization itself or however you feel it would be best to discuss this. Maybe you can touch on, you know, some of the different canons that exist and and maybe lend some insight into the history of canonization, however you feel like going about that. 
Yeah, okay. So um, uh, let's just start out by assuming we're going to piss about half of the people that are listening to you off. And let's just lay it kind of on the line and, and, and get some big better work. Uh, well, first of all, um, we had canon pretty early in that we had a kind of um, a presupposed idea of which books from, from way back, from, from the second century. Um, but out of that, uh, a lot of people like um, that here are lists, the uh, meritorium lists, uh, it's about 24 books, and most of them are identical to ours. The canon is set with three or four criteria. Number one, it must be ancient. So uh, it must be apostolic or the, the, the friends, followers, students of the apostles. Uh, number two, it, it has to be, um, the, 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 the uh, doctrine must be correct. Because if you're in charge, what religion is all about is to keep everyone in lockstep. So you want to narrow your, your doctrine to where uh, you don't allow other doctrine in, everybody keeps going in the same direction. Um, it must be um, accepted in the majority of the churches. You don't want to throw something in and have people fight about it. So uh, was it wasn't accepted. Is it uh, apostolic, and, uh, and and is it uh, following the kin? That is to say, is it following the doctrine? I should say, that the teachings, the orthodoxy, what would be a better word for it? So, uh, so those lists started fairly early. Uh, the problem was that Christianity at that time was was actually more diverse than even Christianity now. So you have Marcion, on the one hand, that could not get through his head. I mean, and I understand where, where the guy's coming from. He did not understand uh, and, and rejected that the Old Testament God was the same as the New Testament God. So, uh, for example, he, uh, let's see, I've got, I've got the list around here someplace that he only accepted, I believe it was the book of John. I have to look. I've got somewhere that I forgot. Uh, no, Luke, yeah. So he accepted the, the, uh, the possible belief, but he didn't accept anything else. And uh, and he believed that the Old Testament should be completely done away with. So he established what actually looks like the first king. And his group was growing very quickly because it made sense, you know. Uh, it made sense. So they believed that Jesus came to... Uh, to kind of show us the true God of what was the New Testament. Uh, you had the Ebionites. They were more of a, uh, a Jewish belief, and, uh, and they did not believe in the virgin birth or the divinity of Jesus. They accepted Matthew, uh, the Valentinians, the rock solid um, Gnostics. They wanted the book of John. And nothing else. So you had all of these things going on. Uh, it looks like um, Irenaeus in about 185 is the first one to go, hey guys, and this is ridiculous because this is actually what said. There are four corners of the earth, there are four winds that are in motion, and by God, there's going to be four gospels, no more, no less. And he put his foot down and it's high up in the church, and so now we have four gospels based on what I think is just like. That the logic is bullshit, but you know they, they took it and they ran with it. So the Morse Knights are growing fast. They've got this cannon, and then everybody's looking around, going, "Well, wait a minute! They've got a cannon. We need a cannon." And so the church starts putting together its cannon. And but the first time that the twenty-seven books are actually mentioned in the order and and with no more or no less was uh, a letter sent from Athanasius, who was in Alexandria at the time, 367 AD. And he sends to the bishop, and so he sends a letter to all of his churches, and he says, here's a list of the New Testament books that we want you to read. Don't want to go outside of it. This is what we're going to stick with. 
And so that became kind of uh, the first time that our canon was, was really uh, articulated. Most people don't understand because there's an idea about the Nicene uh, meeting uh, synod that, you know, uh, it did this, it did that. No. The first time canon was actually written down by the church, accepted and stamped, that is to say, became an edict, um, was in um, print. And that went on between 1545 and 1563. Let that sink in. We really did not have an established, absolute church canon that was written down on paper, signed by the Pope, until the mid-1500s. Now, we really didn't need it because everybody was using the same, same books, and that's thanks to uh, Jerome. Prior to Jerome used the Septuagint. Uh, Jerome started out using the Septuagint, decided that it was not uh, to his liking, and so he tossed that out and he went back to what he could find um, in, 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 in Greek text. So uh, the Septuagint, let me go to book here, let me see. This Bible right here, which is the uh, Orthodox Eastern Church, this, this right here uses the Septuagint. It's, uh, it's the Orthodox Study Bible, and uh, it's translated from the Septuagint. Um, and let's go to King James. The Texas Receptus came from the work, actually, of um, Eusebius. And, uh, and the odd thing about that, <coughs> pardon me, is that he had discovered some uh, Byzantine uh, translations, or, or codexes, actually. So he had Hebrew and, and Greek. In the Byzantine era, which is about 1200, 1200 AD. Think of how many mistakes were made from 45, which is, I think, when Mark was written, 45 to 49 AD, all the way to 1200. How many copies and errors that produced? But that work became our Textus Receptus, which was used in King James. Now, one, one last point. Um, the majority of our translations, especially from around 1300 on to about, uh, well, to King James, were all done because of political pressure. And that's another thing. So, uh, Wycliffe uh, was, let's just say, scolded because he translated the Vulgate into, uh, into English in the 1300s. Um, so when Queen Mary, which is Bloody Mary, came there, well, let's go back just a little bit. Uh, King Henry VIII, okay, he breaks away, uh, he becomes Protestant, he establishes the book of, or the, the Church of England, which we call uh, Episcopal here, by the way. It's the book of the Church, it's the Episcopal Church in the U.S. Uh, and uh, he becomes uh, over that church. And he, he has a, an idea that kings should rule over their individual churches and individual areas and not the popes because the kings know the people and the pope is worldwide. And, you know, what does he know of what's going on in the backwoods of um, Cambodia, whatever. So uh, the idea is that he's now the Church of England's head, the defender of the faith. The pope had said he did not want a laity to have a Bible. King Henry VIII uh, sanctions Fendel um, uh, Covigel to, uh, to make this Bible. It's a huge Bible, so it's huge. Uh, it's, it's over the top. One Bible. Go ahead. I was going to say, is this the one that's called the Great Bible, the, the King Henry version? Yes, uh, and it, it was a great Bible because the darn thing was like three feet across. It was huge. He has it uh, attached by a chain to every single pulpit in his uh, in his area. Every Church of England had one of these Bibles, which was his way of saying, "Hey, Pope, I'm saying I'm not listening to you anymore. You don't want the people to have a Bible. I'm going to produce a Bible for everybody to read. It's right there. It just come up and read it every time." And, and so that was a finger in the eye of the Pope. Now, 
Bloody Mary takes over, she's Catholic. He starts killing all the Protestants. The Protestant scholars scurry off, escape, and go to Geneva, Switzerland, where they produce the Geneva Bible. In the, uh, <clears throat> in the margins of the Geneva Bible, they have notes. It's like the Geneva Bible. Except these notes are such that um, the people have a right to uh, stand up against tyrants. The people um, have a duty to stand up against those who would enslave us. And it's all of these notes in the Geneva Bible that, that just, when, when James I takes the throne, it pisses Bloody Mary off, but it really incenses uh, James, because James is a Protestant, and, uh, <clears throat> and he does not appreciate the fact that the people are uh, reading this Bible, and the Bible is against the, um, the, the hierarchy, the king and the his people. So he is approached by a bunch of uh, Puritans at the time and say, hey, you know, if you do another Bible, you might be able to get rid of the Geneva Bible, and it might bring Scotland and the other places back closer to you. Well, really, they wanted more input into the Bible. They wanted certain things said. Uh, you know, you can twist the translation, and, and you can force your translation until it will admit anything. Uh, so he, he doesn't do that, but he does take the, the uh, suggestion, and, uh, and he sanctions the, uh, the King James Version. So that's how we got the King James was a, a group of, uh, let's call it not missteps, but a group of political plays, one after the other, that generated this Bible. All of them came from the Erasmus text. Um, all of them, you know, fed off of each other, one to the other. Um, now, when, when, uh, when they didn't have for example, part of Revelation was missing in one of these texts, so we actually went back to the Vulgate. So, but there's actually a book that predated the Vulgate, and it probably had uh, influence from the uh, Septuagint. It was called the uh, Vitus Latina, and uh, it was probably produced around 250 AD. And it was actually the first Latin text. It was an old Latin uh, and uh, we believe that the source of that is probably uh, the Septuagint. And, and when Jerome uh, was, was uh, told to produce the, um, the book, uh, The Latin Vulgate, uh, I think he probably views this as kind of a stepping stone, but then he got rid of the Septuagint in his translations and went back to uh, what he considered to be. The more ancient things. So I hope that, that answers some of the questions. It's a, um, religion is driven so much by politics that they can barely be separated at times. Yeah, that's that's so interesting and fascinating. And then I also think about at that time the amount of people in the pop population that were allowed to speak um, or translate latin or hebrew or greek or whatever those languages primarily were that they were um, deriving their future versions of their bibles from and it seems like it would probably be a pretty small amount of the population well, absolutely and that's why they were uh, translating it into the uh, lingua franca um, in, in each nation you know, uh, the Geneva Bible is actually the first Bible that entered the U.S., uh, the Americans, the New World. Um, that, uh, you know, there, there, are, there are problems that people don't really, they don't think about because it's so common here that we have standardized uh, spellings of all of our words. And uh, <clears throat> back before uh, dictionaries, which are pretty modern occurrence, uh, it was almost phonetic. 
And here's another thing. Speaking of phonetics, you go back far enough in Hebrew and the vowels, the vowel points disappear. And, um, and that becomes quite problematic. Um, see, right now we have about 5,000 codices in different pieces and forms with 500,000 variants. Um, and even, you know, even with, um, um, with our, here we go. Even with our uh, ability to mass produce Bibles, couple of examples. Now, this is after Gutenberg, this is 1611. Um, Psalms 119, instead of saying, uh, the princes persecute me, they say, the printers persecute me. Mm. And then there's the wicked Bible that says, thou shalt commit adultery, that was 1631. 1653, Corinthians read, uh, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall inherit the kingdom? Not the righteous, but the unrighteous. 1682, uh, the parable of the vinegar, not the uh, vineyard, was produced. 1793, um, Jesus exhorts the followers to um, let the children be first to be killed instead of the first to be filled. So even after Gutenberg and we had stabilized everything, we still had these errors that came in. And they were just a, you know, that's just a little bit of hand for it. And uh, so you can imagine amplifying that uh, thousands of times with handwritten uh, errors, because there are errors where the eye will skip a line. There are errors where the word on the first line will be the word of the second line, and that line will be completely done away with, because when their eye comes back, they think that they've already said that line, and they go to the next one. For all of these, uh, you know, these, these problems, there's one error that uh, that they looked at and they said, wait a minute, that's not a theta, that's an that's a omicron. Because the difference between an omicron and an omega uh, and a theta is just there's a there's a, a line in the omicron that gives you the theta, right? Yeah. And um, and that connected our feeling of um, of the host, uh, of the Christ. So you know, there's all of these things. And there was... Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to ask about... Um, early, earlier you had mentioned... Um, I think you said the Erasmus texts. Um, you could finish your thought first, and then I was going to ask you about what those texts were that you were refer referring to when you said that. Well, um, I'll just take a little bit now. Erasmus... Um, <clears throat> Erasmus uh, was, was a scholar of languages and uh, theologian, he was a brilliant man, and, uh, and he wanted to take the Bible back to some of the more ancient sources, get away from the Vulgate and all the things that, that um, had happened to that. Because, see, uh, beginning in the third century, um, the, uh, the church fathers were really, really concerned at the amount of errors building up. So he said, well, let's get away from, from the Latin Vulgate, which is copy, and copy, and copy, and go back to uh, the original Greek and Hebrew as far back as we can find. Now, obviously, we don't have the originals. Well, they're, they're long gone. Um, what he did come up with was uh, some, some Byzantine uh, um, codices of Greek and Hebrew, which he set about to translate. <clears throat> Excuse me. So he's comparing all of these things, and he's he's looking for the more more accurate readings by combining them in contrast to compare and all of that stuff. And he comes up with with uh, what is basically the Textus Receptus, uh, the received text, which is where the majority of the Bibles came from. From that point on, you know, the Geneva Bible, the Great Bible, and the King James Bible, they used to be these new sources. So, but 
this is a kind of deep dive, and I apologize to your listeners if this is kind of boring, but let's take a couple of really quick points. We think we have this Bible and it's inspired. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were probably not written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They never say they were. And, and you have to kind of let that sink in. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were probably not written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They were probably dead. Like, the average life expectancy in that particular time is 35 to 45. So some of these are, are so old, like the book of John, for example, is so old, it probably was never, could never, I mean, you could have lived 100 years and not be. But these things were, were written in the third person. So there were probably people who knew these guys, but they were not these guys. And it never says that they were. If you read them, it never says, I, Matthew, wrote this book. So that's the first thing. Second thing is, there's so much that has been added, especially going up to the Texas Receptus because you have 1,200 years, that you have to look at this and go, exactly what happened here? And I'll give you an example. Every year in my area of the country, people die from handling snakes or from drinking poison because we have a group of people in San Malcolm, right up the road, up in Alabama. And they're in Georgia, Tennessee, and Alabama, and San And they're usually um, in the coastal homes. And they bring out the snakes, and they bring out the strip nine, and you know, it's the way we'll die. And then they will say, well, it's because you didn't have enough faith. Well, no, it's because the end of Mark didn't exist. The end of Mark, in the very, very oldest witnesses, ends with uh, the girls seeing Jesus. And telling no one because they didn't think they would believe them. And it stops. The scribes said, Well, that's not good. That's not theater. That won't preach. That's kind of flat. Let's make an ending to it. And so there are four distinct endings of Mark. And, uh, we like this one. It became tradition because it stuck around for so long. It preaches really, really well. And so now we have this end of Mark where it says, uh, and they will pick up, or they pick up snakes and they will drink poison, they will kill the sick, they'll raise the dead. And, uh, and you know, this end right there has this wonderful ending, which is never in the beginning of the text, the great original oldest text. Um, there are other things. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, it does not exist in the older text. The Lord's Prayer just simply ends. Before the doxology, uh, the, uh, the the story of the woman being caught in adultery is a phenomenal story. I love it. It doesn't exist in the older versions. Also, in the older versions, the number of the beasts was six sixteen, not six sixteen six. Oh, really? Well, wow. it turns out. Yeah. So it turns out that, um, that there's a, a theory called preterism, and that says that uh, what they were writing about had already come to pass. The writing uh, is a warning um, to the people at the time. So if you take the different ways of spelling Nero Caesar, there are two ways of spelling it uh, because of the, uh, the sigma uh, either or not being there in certain translations. Um, you come up with 666 on one hand and 616 on the other. I think we went spelling into the metric, and it's before it measured into the language. So the very oldest ones, you'll have 616. Lots and lots of changes. Um, too many to, to, to fill up your show with. It would be boring if you end up. Yeah. I think that that's an interesting point, too. Like, just the old, I think it might be called gematria as well, is, is kind of a layer of interpretation. And with a lot of these biblical um, books and so on, I've I've recently had listened to a an interview with a man named Timothy Hogan, where he was kind of going into various layers of interpretation versus just, you know, 
what people would maybe assume just from glancing over these texts, but there's there's kind of like the historical layer or mystical interpretation, or there's like uh, g- g- gematria, which is kind of like how certain things can sort of be encoded. And that's also another um, big point to make that there's always usually more that meets the eye to all of these things. All right, just back from a quick break. Um, you're saying you were looking for a book just now, but you weren't able to find it. Um, what was that about? No. Scriptural Enumerates was written by Ed Bullinger, uh, who's actually a friend of my grandfather. Uh, wrote, uh, the thing probably came out in the 50s or 60s. Wrote an interesting and very insightful and interesting uh, book on the value and many numbers in the scriptures. Uh, it's, it's worth uh, looking at it. Yeah, to check that out. Yeah, um, yeah, it's always, it's always uh, fascinating just to kind of dive a little bit deeper into even just things like the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and there's there's some understandings of how they may also correlate with particular constellations um, in terms of the ancient astrological correlations. And not to say that that's 100% for certain, but I think it definitely, just those kinds of insights, they lend a lot more of a overall uh, view of how and what some of these things could be conveying that are confusing and often not understood because there's there's so much throughout the bible that sometimes you read some things and you're just like i don't really understand what is trying to be communicated there but sometimes if you look at things through different lenses you can kind of pick up on oh okay in this context that makes sense yeah um there's a book out uh uh, called the story and and the stars uh, or the scriptures and the stars or something like that. And it takes every constellation and it, it basically relates it back. If you start with Virgo, then you have the entire story of Christendom in the stars. Wow. Uh, it's an interesting book. And it goes through every single constellation, tells you basically what the uh, stage was, what it means as far as uh, going to... Uh, Christendom, and you can go through the whole thing from birth to resurrection. I was just going to bounce back a little bit because I wanted to ask you a question about, like, in relation to uh, canonization. I wonder um, when a lot of these sort of bickerings were going back and forth between different kings and popes and whatnot this is probably has a lot to do with why certain texts were either left out or, or included depending on kind of the personalities that were in charge of the time and the whole, uh, like you had mentioned with like the different political things going on. Would you say that that's kind of a fair statement? Yeah. It had more to do with the interpretation after the once Kenny was established, uh, it, it didn't really vary that much, except from those churches that weren't tied to the uh, Roman Catholic Church. Uh, see, if you're, stat- if you're Orthodox and you're, you're Roman Catholic, you, you, but, but if you don't belong to that church, you don't have to follow that canon. Now, the Protestants inherited the canon, and uh, they didn't really question it. Don't ask me why. I, I would have probably been in the room. Hey, guys. Um, if you track it back far enough, the Apocalypse of Peter was in certain canons in the very beginning, and it was dropped. They had the Apocalypse of John, which is what we now call Revelation, because Apocalypse is, is, is to reveal, and to reveal is Revelation. And so the Apocalypse of John is Revelation of John. It's actually the Revelation of Jesus Christ to John. So there was an apocalypse of Peter in the very beginning. And I, I would highly recommend the readers kind of look over this. Interesting. 
may actually be how uh, Dante got his idea of hell, because uh, the apocalypse of Peter is, uh, is, is a picture, tour, if you will, of hell. And, uh, and to kind of sum it up, if you're a bad guy and you've uh, lied, you're going to be hung um, over hell you know, by the tongue. And uh, if you're a woman and you've braided your hair to get men to notice you, you'll be hung by the hair. And if you're an adulterer, you'll be hung by other things. So there you go. And you'll burn forever with, uh, you know, hooked up in the most un uh, unenjoyable way. So, <laughs> um, there was also uh, a gospel of Peter in the very beginning that was accepted for a short period of time. It's a, it's a great book. It's a, it's a very powerful book. Looks a whole lot like uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, except when Jesus comes out of the tomb, he's, he, he, he expands. It's like, metaphorically, he is up to heaven. And the, and the cross is coming out with him, this metaphorical cross. And God asks the cross, have you preached to all people? And the cross says, yes, I have. And so uh, the reason that that book was taken out of the running, if you will, for Ken, is because it has one sentence in it that looks docetic. Docetism is the belief that Jesus actually wasn't a flesh and blood person, he was a spirit that was an illusion of a person. Uh, it's a Gnostic belief. And, and this one line says that when he was being crucified, he kept silent, like he felt a pain. And uh, one of the bishops said, uh, that then at first he, he okayed the book, and then he came back and said, well, you know, this could be looked at as Gnostic, that one line, so we'll get rid of it, and it was done away with. And that's, uh, that happened uh, you know, quite often. You'd have a, a book that was read and, and it, it was uh, you know, cool, you know, a good book. It was. And then you'd have one line where they'd go, oh, that doesn't sound orthodox. Maybe it was the whole thing. Uh, so that's, that's really how we kind of got to it. Yeah. And are you able to speak a little bit to some of the discrepancies between the Gnostic? lines of thinking as and and how that was kind of in conflict with the majority of the church during those times i know that gnosticism is one of those things i get a lot of different opinions about so i'm always curious and interested to sort of ask anybody what their thoughts are on that well um i think you have to cut through the uh if you cut through the creation myth and not the system, get to the heart of it and you understand why it took off. People have been asking from the beginning why bad things happen to people. Why is this earth so messed up? Why do we have disease and all of this stuff? And Christendom in the very beginning, didn't have really a, a, a Satan the way that we do now. We, <clears throat> Satan has grown over the years into his own little goddom and uh, his own little kingdom. It wasn't like that in the very beginning. He was just uh, uh, the accuser. He was just you know, going back and forth going, hey, check that out. Hey, look at him. Um, and he was considered to be just a, a, a lowable angel, kind of a pest. Then we, we contacted, uh, there's, there's a theory of cross-pollination within religion that seems to hold up pretty well. And so Zoroastrianism kind of came in and, and it had a bifurcated uh, cosmology and we kind of took over that. So now we have two people that are vying, you know, God and, and say, brain Satan up to a little, a little doctor. Okay, so Gnosticism. But the very beginning, Gnosticism said, the reason this place is so messed up is because the God that created it was insane. The Vinny Earth was broken. And so from a broken, insane, cruel 
creator in a broken, insane, cruel world. And everybody went, that freaking makes sense. And Gnosticism kind of took off. Marcion, you know, uh, he, he's viewed as a Gnostic because he said, the God of the Old Testament created these worlds. And that God is not the God that Jesus is teaching. Two different gods. And everybody went, that makes sense. Because how can this God, who, for example, said to the Israelites, go into this land and kill everything that moves. Don't leave anything alive. Because I have a theory about that, that that's where the fallen angels were. That's beside the thing. Don't leave anything alive. What is he doing? Well, King Saul brings back hostages. He is deep from the deposit. He, he shut down. Samuel, Samuel says, God's had enough. Uh, he might digress. So Gnosticism, in my mind, has a couple of things in common with who's Gnostic you are. If you're Valentinus or you're you know, Russian or whatever, uh, you believe that... Um, the God that created this world is not the God of Jesus. You believe that the God who created this world is broken and cruel, and that's why this world is broken and cruel. Most of the time, the Gnostics believe that Jesus had come to show us the way to the one true God. The, not the Creator, not the Demiurge, but the in, in the Pomora, uh, the, the, the actual Creator, Father of everything, including the Dinger Age. And that, that pretty much is what we have in common. So, and everything in my mind could be that. So, if you're giving me some, I'm old, you know, sometimes I forget things. Absolutely. Well, um, so kind of going back to the different Bibles, you kind of went through a lot of them, but. Um, Thinking about uh, like the King James version in particular, I think that's a pretty revered version. I, I have a King James among a couple other ones, but um, so I don't really know a whole lot about King James. I'm not sure if you if you do. I'm, I was always kind of curious just about him as an individual. Um, kind of wanted to learn more about that, who he was, and what were some <laughs> of any interesting aspects about him. Or <laughs> I don't know. He was gay. Oh, really? Um, it's pretty, pretty, pretty much as yeah. Um, he's married, he's got kids, you know, and all that stuff. But um, my, my wife is the expert on heraldry and lineage and all of that stuff. So uh, I said, Lynn, tell me a little bit about King James. And she hands me a book that she's gotten from England and she went over there for the last time. And she said, you'll find this interesting. Um, I'm not so much. This is, this is what I'm looking for. I've got stacks and stacks and stacks of papers here. Give me just a second. And no worries. Take your time. Off. I looked at the book and went, you must be kidding me. Let's see here. Yeah, there's a lot of King James loyalists out there. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm going to get you in trouble with it, and I'm sorry. But no worries. That's what it's all about. <laughs> uh, okay, two principal favorites of James the First were his, in succession were Robert Kerr, K-E-R Kerr, and uh, George Bellinger, uh, B-I-L-L-I-E-R-S. Uh, both were good-looking, high-spirited young men. Uh, Kerr had been King's page. He was credited, uh, so he became Earl of Somerset in 1613, made a member of the Privy Council, entrusted with uh, the king's most intimate business. He angered the nation by encouraging the king to make an alliance with Spain by helping him uh, raise dubious taxes. By 1616, the king had taken George Villiers who quickly became the Earl of Buckingham, uh, and he dominated the king to the extent that the king put himself into a position of a humbled husband. Let that sink in. Writing a letter to him, the king said, 
God bless you, my sweet child and wife, and grant you that ye may forever be a comfort to your dear dad and husband, James. Ready then. What? <laughs> I don't think it gets any clearer than that. <laughs> Yeah, this started with uh, S.N.A. Stewart, who was uh, uh, the Duke of Lennox. It was his first cousin. And uh, I think that, that probably was the first time that, that the king went, I think I'm gay. And um, so they had this little thing going on when they were very close friends. And, and the uh, scuttle around the castle was that um, they were more than just, you know, just friends. Uh, but uh, it made its way uh, very, very clear. With uh, this gentleman named George um, Valiers, and I'll spell it again: B-I-L-L-I-E-R-S. And uh, he was the um, the Earl of Buckingham. So yeah, yeah that's uh, so. There you go. Uh, Very um, interesting. I would say, and for those listening, if you're gay, no disrespect. Um, it's just interesting given the whole Christian worldview, especially at this time, and kind of the irony behind that. I would say. <laughs> that's what I'm shooting for. It's not, you know, it's nothing wrong with being gay. It's the fact that these guys were counting this super uber uh, conservative stance and writing the King James version of the Bible. And, and, and which would be used in perpetuity against uh, homosexuality, and yet he is practicing. So there you go. Precisely, yes. <laughs> A little blurb there. Throw that out there. <laughs> um, so earlier when you're, I think you, the the version you had showed me a while back was that Ethiopic text and did that one i might be having this confused was that one does that include the book of enoch or am i getting that confused no that's uh oh okay this is, this is the uh, eight that, that was Biden, the orthodox uh, Eastern orthodox and it's uh it is the septuagint okay i apologize my my mistake on that no problem the, the ethiopic bible does include not only the book of uh Enoch, but the book of Jubilees also, uh, which Jubilees is um, an expansion of, um, of Genesis. And of course, the book of Enoch is, um, or that, that book is quoted by Peter and Jude and alluded to by Jesus. It informs our angelology and demonology to this day. Uh, it's a, a, a if you look at uh, the, the sequences on uh, um, um, second and third Enoch, you, you get way after. Yeah, I feel like the Book of Enoch is one that it just seems absolutely like it should be standard and included in among most of the canons, just in terms of how much it contributes. I was maybe we can talk a little bit about kind of the background in regards to the Book of Enoch and what's what's in there and. Uh, how was it kind of discovered, and and how did it come into translation as we know it now? In the seventeen hundreds, a gentleman was over in uh, Ethiopia, and he discovered this. I mean, it's a it, discovery. It's there. It's in their canon. So, but nobody had paid much attention because you know what comes out of Ethiopia. There's nothing there really. So he goes in and he, and he, he looks at this thing. This actually makes reference to um, his teacher. This, this is where I have trouble selecting a path because my mind kind of goes like this. In our book of uh, Leviticus, there is a Point there that they're selecting the scapegoat, and it says they choose two goats one for God and one for Azazel. Azazel, isn't that the main demon? Yeah. That's the guy in the book of Enoch that says all sin is attributed to him because of what he taught mankind. So you have in the book of Enoch these. 200 watches that are made to uh, 
can keep track of us, categorize, qualify, and quantify what we're doing in these two notes. And then we come down to the early product. They also give us some of that, and they come down and they make a balloon. And they produce three separate types of offspring. The Elio Nephilim, which means the fallen, to the giants, which we believe the Elio was probably the new renowned to the new Joseph's story. So that's probably the killings and the killings and all of those kind of hybrid humans. But all of that is, uh, is wrapped up in, in you know, it's a problem. Uh, a lot of the, the uh, that came after the There's a tradition called the Midrash tradition. And it's a, it's a way of story that's written. It's an expansion of a story to explain something that hasn't been explained in the scriptures. But for example, if you look in the book of Genesis, there are two separate creation stories. They're different. And everybody, everybody reads the Bible like it's going to blow through it and they kind of swish it together. And in their mind, they're making one story. If you really want to know what's going on, you read it parallel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John parallel. Uh, Genesis, you read in sections. So if you look at Genesis 1 versus Genesis 2, you have two separate, completely different uh, creation stories. Okay, so, and, and, and so you have to, the, the Jews are very liberal people. They, they want to make everything make sense. So, it looks like maybe you have two wives. One was made with him out of the dust. One was made from him out of a rib. From the first story, they had to get rid of her. It became Lilith. Mm. Lilith was that demon. So uh, Lilith uh, defies uh, God and Adam and flies off, and, and she's her own person, and she becomes a demon. And in the old stories of uh, the Middle Ages in Hebrew, in Jews, uh, she was the one that took the, uh, the life of your children, that was, uh, infant mortality was due to Lilith. Uh, so were nocturnal ejaculations, because she was supposed to come in and sit on the face. And that's actually written in the, in the Hebrew text, that, that's, that causes men to ejaculate. Mm. Um, so all of our woes are, are wrapped up in Lilith, who was the first wife of Adam, because that was the first, you know, so that's the way stories have to be concocted, right? Which leads me back to, to uh, this problem with Enoch. Enoch is a man, it's taken up, and now we have a problem, because flesh and blood cannot abide in heaven. That's what the Jews think. So we better do something about it. So in the book of Second Enoch and Third Enoch, you see Enoch going up into heaven and becoming Metatron. When he enters heaven, uh, the angels literally say, I smell semen and it stinks. Who is here in heaven? And, uh, and God basically says, it's, uh, it's Enoch, and uh, you're going to have to worship him because he's going to be over you. He's going to be over the angels. And they throw a fit. So God pretty well fixes that. He makes him a higher angel. He makes him Metatron. We have an evolution of Enoch happening. I contend that that story is a mythos in the... Uh, Joseph Campbell style of myth that shows the possible evolution spiritually of mankind itself, that we can and, and have the ability to ascend, um, to be more than what we are, and to uh, become, uh, let's just call it lesser creators. At the end of Third Enoch, he is referred to as the lesser Yahweh. And uh, so you have this, this mortal who becomes an angel, who becomes a god. Yeah, there's, from what I understand, 
there's so many parts of the Bible that the book of Enoch has parallelisms with, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but aren't there even almost direct passages that are included in the book of Enoch that pop out um, in the common biblical canons as well? Yes, uh, the book of um, Jude. So this is how I got started down this rabbit hole, because I will tell you right off that uh, in seminary, you're really more indoctrinated than educated. And so I'm, uh, I'm going through my thesis, and I run across this quote from Jude that says, he will come back with 10,000 of its saints to attempt to the world. In the footnote, it said, see 1 E-N, and I thought, well, what's 1 E-N? I don't know that book, and I looked it up, and it was first Enoch. So I thought, well, a book that is quoted for an entire paragraph, and multiple lines, not right out of the Bible, should probably be looked into. And uh, when I looked into it, it uh, every translation I could find was a stilty Elizabethan fake English. It was, it was just full of pompous language that was made to confuse people. And I, I came home and I said, Lynn, this book is important. I, I really feel in my gut that it's important. And I'm going to do a fresh translation. And I'm going to do it like they did in the 1970s with um, the, um, the Bible. Um, probably too young to, to know this, but back in the day, we, we had Good News for Modern Men, which was a very uh, modernized, uh, really accessible translation of the key texts. And it, and it was partially credited with uh, keeping the Jesus movement going. I want to do it in that style, but a little bit less frivolous, and uh, so I start, set about to, um, to, to do it. When I got through with it and I published it, about a month later, it went to number uh, 700, which doesn't sound very good, but 700 out of, at that time, 7 million on, on Amazon. I, I thought I was king of the world for a moment, okay. <laughs> but it's a little bit of having, you know, it's the king of Tiddly Winks, right? It doesn't last long. It's very small. Uh, um, and I thought, you know, there's, there's hunger for this knowledge that's that's kept from people. And so I did second and third in it also, and we put it out. So, this book. Wow, it's a thick one, too. This book. This book has been number one for about seven years. Wow. Uh, in its little genre, which I think is uh, Christian wisdom literature. Yeah, um, <clears throat> pardon me. It, it was um, uh, sky. It, it felt like I was there, and it happened. If that makes any sense. I was curious because you do the. It's there's three books, I guess. They're book Enoch one, Enoch two, and Enoch three. Um, which I wasn't actually aware of that. So I was wondering if at one point was there only a single book and then it got developed further into those three books and then consolidated. Like are all three of them considered the book of Enoch or are they considered individual books? Great question. And no, uh, the first book of Enoch is the only thing found in the in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, that book looks like it was actually considered to be canon by the, uh, the early uh, Christians or late Jews, um, probably read by Jude, read by Peter, considered to be, I, I won't say canon, canon is wrong word, um, not canon, but authoritative. Right? So there's a, there's a difference. Like, for example, uh, Joseph Smith said that the book of Jasher, although it was not canon, was of great importance and should be read. Um, so you have know, different, you know, different, uh, structures of this is canon, but this is important, I mean, this is heretical, so stay away from it. You know. So this is on the, it is very important, and they considered it to be, to be um, of great use. 
in an apparently informed way. Now, another problem we have in um, translation is something called palimpsest. Um, occasionally, we will run across. Let's let's make an example. You come to me, and you have a book of uh, Mark, and I have a book of Enoch, and you have another book of Mark at home. So you can get rid of your book of Mark. And so what you'll do is you'll take your, your, your vellum, your, your uh, parchment, and you'll scrape it. And you'll remove the top surface which has the book of Mark on it. And you'll write over it the book of Matthew. Or, I'm sorry, vice versa. And so now you have a book of Enoch and a book of Matthew. And you can take that back home with you. Um, and that happens more often than not because uh, the writing implements at the time, especially the, the parts of the heart come by. So they would reuse it, they would wash it, scrape it, reuse it. Well, it turns out that not all ink is the same. And uh, if you bombard these inks with separate uh, wavelengths, we can get one ink to fluoresce more than the other. Mm. And you can actually read what is below uh, the first copy within the palimpsest. Wow. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you said if okay. you bombard it with particular wavelengths, you're able to to bring forward the the older text into visibility. Is that correct, what you're saying? Yeah, I, I was called by uh, the Travel Channel at one time to come to LA and kind of explain all of this. And I came up with a little little thing that really kind of helped everybody out. The, they didn't air this, but the uh, producers needed to know what they were dealing with. So uh, you see this right here? Uh, you can pretend that that's a text. Okay. So for the, oh, wow. Okay. So for the listeners, um, he's, displaying a piece of paper that when you're just looking at it head on it just looks like a blotch of white or a blotch of red on the white paper but when he shines this light on it it illuminates and brings forward the text that's behind that red is it is it correct that that text is behind the red or is it written over the top of it or no it's not one color uh, one ink just the word text and then I just colored over it with uh, with another color ink. But I know that that uh, first ink fluoresces at uh, a UV. Um, I forget what this is. Seven hundred fifty, I think, nanometers. And uh, anyway, when you hit it with that, it pops out. That is so cool. So you can actually doing that with everything from infrared to uh, you know just pick a frequency, and you, you ramp it up until you find that sweet spot where the palimpsest pops up. And normally it's, uh, you know, two or three frequencies. Wow. And okay. And then so are you saying that when you were going through some of these old texts that you were able to use this technology to see what had previously been written over? Is that correct? Yeah, not not me personally, no. but uh, this is the technology that they're using. And uh, they're discovering text underneath text right now, or they have been since seven. Uh, and when they when they look at these texts, they will, they will do this. So they'll, they'll look at all these frequencies and they'll go, well, this pops out more, or wow, did you know that there was something underneath there? It's called a palimpsest. That's. Um, Readers, it's uh, E A L I M P S E S P. S P. So fascinating, and I I wanted to get your input on the idea of rapture and how this kind of got embedded into a lot of the modern Christian doctrines, and yeah, just any input or thoughts into this uh, whole rapture idea kind of switching gears a little bit, but that's one thing I wanted to ask you about. I, I thought that was a really fascinating question because it's never been asked me before. 
And it actually is kind of a hot button in mind. Um, so uh, prior to the seven, 1700s, 1800s, the idea of a rapture never existed. It, it was not even on the radar. It, it was not a theological issue. It didn't have a name because it wasn't ever considered. So Jesus is an apocalyptic Jew. And and uh, and therefore so is uh, it's, it's Paul. Well, I think that Paul kind of, kind of Shanghai Christianity, but we can get into that in another today. Uh, under Paul, Christianity became religion about Jesus instead of Jesus' religion, which was actually Judaism being remade. So the rapture doesn't exist. The rapture is not uh, a, a thought. The, the theology at the time is that Jesus is coming back and everyone's waiting for the return. But um, there's a novel in, nine, in 1827 that's written in Spain by a guy by the name of uh, uh, Kunza. L A C N Z A, um, and and it's uh, the story of the coming the, the Messiah of glory and majesty of Israel. It, it's the Left Behind series of the time. It's a nice little novel. It, it's it's a fiction based on religion, and uh, and and he sets about to describe this this idea of the rapture by taking a piece from Thessalonians and a piece from uh, Revelation, here and there, it mixes them together, and he gets this picture of the rapture. And it's in this, uh, it's in this context. That we but the guy by the name of Edward Cody, and he's a preacher, but he's kind of a Pentecostal ardent, you know, kind of radical. He's, he's preaching in uh, the churches in Scotland, where it is. And, um, and this guy says, I heard a voice, and it told me about the rapture, and uh, I'm going to preach the rapture, and this is going to be, you know. Well, it turns out that this guy had actually translated this book from Spanish into English. He read the book, he liked the story, he claimed it as his own, he said God told him so. And the church said, see you later, you don't belong here, and you was too radical for us, and they picked him up. Enter John Darby, uh, is a, a preacher. And he gets this idea, and he hears about it, and it really intrigues him. So he goes over and meets this Irving guy, Edward Irving, and, and they strike up this friendship, and he learns all about this idea of the rapture, and he goes away. And he develops this theology around it. He puts all of the scriptures together. Let me just stop by saying that um, there's, a, there's a list of Pauline epistles, I think like 13 of them. But about half of those, we believe, probably aren't written by Paul in the first place. And um, get out the list and, and see which is which. But within those, uh, you, you have. Some of these that he mentions, and I'll get back to it later. Anyway, um, and that's, that's another thing. It's like in the scriptures, some of the stuff he's using really didn't belong to Paul in the first place. They're, 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 fairly, they're fairly certain Paul didn't write all the Pauline epistles. The Darby didn't know that, and people don't care. They you know, didn't use the Bible like it was well informed. He comes up with this rapture and starts preaching it. Schofield gets a hold of the idea. Schofield says, Man, this thing preaches so great. I mean, it is phenomenal. It will rev, rev up a crowd, it will get them going, and consequently, so the numbers and so does the money. And Schofield puts the idea of the rapture in his Bible, in his notes. The Schofield Reference Bible was like the, the gold standard of time. 
And when it, it entered the Schofield uh, uh, Bible, it became Bible. And that's how we got the rap sheet. Wow. We went from a book written probably in the beginning of the 1700s, published in the 1800s, and by the end of the 1800s, we had the rapture, and we can't get rid of it. And it was never known before then. Wow, that's fascinating. I did not know that. Um, so, aside from yourself, who would you say are some of the individuals out there that have a really solid grasp on these things, like in terms of how to look at all these very different texts and kind of make sense of them all in a very informed manner, in your opinion? Uh, the best guy out there right now is Bart Furman. Hmm. He's a uh, chapel in North Carolina. I think I'm aware of him. He he comes at a lot of this from a, a very historical perspective. Is that is that right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, the following letters that we think are not Paul is uh, First Timothy, Second Timothy, and Titus. Probably not Paul. Colossians, Ephesians, and Second Co uh, uh, Thessalonians. Uh, probably yes, Paul. Romans, First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, Philippians, First Thessalonians, and Philemon, or by the um, So you know, there's the breakdown of. We're pretty sure that about half of these are not Paul, uh, and yet here we are. Yeah. So, in all of your years of kind of looking into these various things, what would you say are a couple of the biggest, like, wow? shocks or moments or realizations that have really struck you and made an impact on um, your overall thinking? Maybe just some really cool insights that you've gleaned from all of your research and understanding that you feel are noteworthy. Um, the fact that none of this really makes a difference, that um, that we can dig all we want, and uh, and we should. But at the end of the day, it's not going to make any difference. Our our idea of what God is does not change God one bit. Our idea of what uh, created us it doesn't change the fact that we're here. And uh, and whether Jesus said this or that. Um, if we look at him and we look at his teaching uh, and we even get rid of the things that we think probably were, were presented for him and not by him like the long cut and um, we still have the most rock solid way of living uh, and even if you are an Ebionite type of Christian, you don't believe he's divine because the divinity of Jesus looks like it, it has evolved. Um, it, it really doesn't make any difference because the teaching of the man is probably the pinnacle of humankind. So you know, I, I leave you with that. Aha moments probably came when I realized that um, that a great part of the scriptures uh, were added or were changed. But even if you take those away, uh, don't touch the teaching. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I I always think that whether you believe that Jesus existed literally or you think it's all just a myth it, it, regardless it's more just overall about the message that's trying to be conveyed it doesn't necessarily matter that you have to accept that this was actually a literal thing and you're not required to believe that for the purposes of your quote-unquote salvation in my humble opinion but i think that it's just the message behind these stories and all the the ideas that they communicate and how that can help uplift and um, 
and how that can lend insight into psychology or lend insight into the understanding of uh, the nature of things. And I just think that those are really important takeaways for people. Yeah, I think that we should step away from the modern church and these toothy bastards that want our money. And uh, we, should, we should really focus on the message. Uh, the, the church is forever evolving. Uh, the Immaculate Conception of Mary, that is to say, the doctrine in the Roman Catholic Church that says that Mary was born without sin. Uh, because Jesus was born without sin, therefore he needed a a vessel without sin. Uh, to me, it's kind of preposterous because then Mary's mother, Anna, would have to be in an infinitum back to Eve, which is her original sin, which I don't believe in anyway. But that only was made uh, ex cathedra uh, from, from, from the seat of uh, law. In 1854, uh, the assumption of Mary into heaven was uh, mentioned by the church in 1950. She became the queen of heaven in 1954. She became a redemptress in 1804. All of these are, are very, very, very new. And, and the church has gotten rid of one um, As of 2007, they, they didn't come out and say Limbo doesn't exist, but they, they did say that they have all the uh, confidence, if you will, that uh, unbaptized children really don't go to hell. Um, these things, to me, are ridiculous and preposterous that, that a church or a man uh, thinks that they can evoke and create uh, an entire statuses for unborn for unbaptized children, things like this. So my message is get away from the, uh, the modern church and rescue spirituality from religion. Look at the words of Jesus. Look at the pinnacle of mankind um, and, and try just day by day do a little bit about what he said and forget about what the church is telling me. It's, it's all just again. Amen. Um, I want to ask you a couple kind of like fun questions, just sort of off topic uh, before we wrap up. But you were, you know, you're, you know, we talked a little bit, but like technology, technological things are always really interesting. And I had mentioned in the intro uh, that you were contracted with the DOD at a particular time um, with projects involving hypersonic missile technology and supercomputer clustering. So I was just curious if you could kind of talk a little bit about that and what were maybe some of your contributions or developments in these it's regards. It's classified because it's been long enough. So if you're, if you're interested, you can look at Mach 5, M-A-C-H 5, comma, COLSA, C-O-L-S-A, and you'll see the project. So the hypersonic missile that they say that we don't have, that China does have, we had under Obama. But Obama, after three months of being president, came in and shut down the project. So it's not like we don't have it. It's like we tabled it until China overtook us. At that time, we had 1,600 uh, computers running on a very, very fast backbone. And uh, we were the 15th fastest on the planet, according to top500.org. The top500.org will not tell you what the NSA or other three other agencies have. But those agencies that were reporting the computer speed, we were number 15 on the planet. And uh, our, our uh, mission was to uh, model uh, hypersonic missiles in rarefied gas, and so it's to say the upper atmosphere, and to figure out how we can uh, do that faster and better. And um, wow, that's super interesting. <laughs> a lot of money went into it because uh, they screwed up the first time. Yeah. Quick, uh, sorry. Yeah. So, <clears throat> they fired this, this is a test out of, uh, out of the Marshall uh, Island Channel. So, 
fire missile goes up. And then they fire the uh, hypersonic missile. And what it's supposed to do is go up, kick in the scramjet, and look out and see the intercept path, calculate the vector, and intercept. And they were so good that they could actually calculate <clears throat> to within two or three inches of where it was going to hit on that missile. Um, they actually had a, uh, a bank, if you will, in the missile that told them what type of missile they were seeing in the, on the state signature and where the sweet spot on the missile was. They had everything down to the inch. Wow. Yeah, it seems like a... Wow. Yeah, it seems like a pretty advanced kind of advanced trajectory mapping sort of technology or something along those lines. But what happened in the first test is that um, in rarefied gases, you can't steer by fins. You must steer by jet because you have no drag to steer with if you get up there. And so wings don't work. So it fires uh, a steering jet. And within about three milliseconds, a vortex has formed. And it, if this is the missile and this is the jet, the vortex is now coming around to the end of the missile, just swirling around. And then it's infrared. So it sees its own tailpipe, basically. It sees its own heat signature. And it goes, wait a minute. I no longer see the incoming missile. I don't know where I am. I'm going to self-destruct. So that was our first, that was, that was where my team came in. Uh, and, and there were 42 of us or thereabouts. And I was just one of the, uh, one of the, the guys that helped go with me. And, you know, it's been low on the totem pole, but I was sitting under a, a doctor of physics by the name of John Medeiros, who wrote a book, by the way, on, human color vision. If you want to read an interest, interesting take on the human eye, um, there's a lot for you. It was, it was a, a phenomenal gig. I was there for a decade and I loved it. I bet. Yeah. So as you know, you have a, a pretty kind of decent grasp and actual real world experience with like technology. Do you have any concerns in terms of up and coming technologies and where they might be leading um, modern day with things like maybe artificial intelligence or things along those lines, or what would you say about that? Yeah, I, I do. Um, I don't know if I'm mortified or anything, but I'm very curious as to what's going to happen. I think the human brain is actually uh, quantum. Exactly how our neurons work, the more obvious. Dr. Medeiros had said that by the time we hit about 20. I think your mic. Sorry, your mic was cutting out a little bit. I don't know if it picked up that last couple sentences, but I'll let you go ahead and rephrase it. Dr. Medeiros had said at one time that. Um, by about 2030, we'd probably be similarly self-awareness. Uh, based on the fact that we're, we're now, excuse me, we now have really fairly good working quantum uh, computers. And uh, we'll get that worked out and we'll be large enough. Uh, we'll probably have uh, sentience. I don't know what that's going to mean. It was just his idea of him tossing out there based on the ends of the room. These guys are so bright, so when you walk into the room, when they walk into the room, the air changes. Um, it's like, wow, I'm getting to see you. Let's see the feel. I miss the, uh, the, uh, I miss the camaraderie and grace of the whole thing. Well, Dr. Lumpkin, you're a legend. Um, I just want to thank you again for your time. If if you have any last messages at all that you just want to throw out there, um, the floor is yours. You can maybe leave people with a message or leave your um, your links or where people could find your books, anything. Well, if you just go to Amazon and type in my name, you probably come up. Uh, 
fifthestate.com. We called it that because, if you remember, there were four estates of the French. It was uh, broken down into the king, the clergy, the people, and the press. And my thought was the press has failed us, and we have become the press. We have become the press. And so there is the fifth estate. So fifthestate.com will get you there for this type of many, many times. Um, our, our purpose, I believe, is to reach the second actual age. Well, the first, first was, was when Buddha, Confucius, Matsu, or Astra, Jesus, and then all of them just a few hundred years of each other. We're coming up on kind of a splitting point. And I'm afraid that if we do not make that second large leap, where we can leave religion behind and find spirituality in God, we're probably going to destroy each other. So, religion is the poison to the well, in my opinion, and that's a person who's been raised in religion all of my life. I see the constructs of the church and the doctrine as like glass. You can see the truth through it, but you can't touch it. And so we have to strip away that and get rid of all the preconceived ideas and find um, our spiritual selves. And when we do that, I believe that um, we will not get to Amen. All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, greatly appreciate it and highly re recommend that people go check out your books. I know that I have a, a bunch on my list, on my never-ending list of books. So, <laughs> um, yeah, just thank you again. I appreciate it.